back in that Get It Over series. Get over it. And uh, I'm actually going to do it. I don't know if we'll be doing it another Wednesday or not. But uh, but anyway, what we're going to do with this series too is we're going to put this thing together. And we're going to make it a part of our partnership class down here. And uh, instead of the bait of Satan by John Bevere. John Bevere ain't no better than we are, is he? If you're watching, John, I like you, though. <laughs> I don't think he's watching me yet like I watch him. <laughs> but one day you will be. I can speak those things, amen? But uh, we're going to be back in this uh, tonight, and then I don't know if we'll do another one or not. We'll see what the Lord has us. But uh, I think it's needed right now. I think it's needed, and... Uh, this, this message tonight, uh, I believe, is right on time once again. Uh, but we're going to be on our anchor scripture, which is Luke 17, 1. And then from there, we're going to flip over to 1 Peter uh, chapter 2. So we'll go to Luke 17, 1 first. Hallelujah. Has anybody else got a praise report they want to they wanna give? Who said that? Hold on a minute. Come on up here, Elder. Uh, last Friday, I guess most of you already know, I was delivering some boxes to the school. We were having a yard sale there in Monticello. And across the, sort of across the highway there, uh, I looked one way and probably didn't look the other way. But a guy broadsided me. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. The devil will try to take you out any way he can. Amen. But we are covered by the blood. Amen. Amen. So tonight we're going to be in 17.1, and then we're going to flip over to uh, 1 Peter. But uh, 17.1 says this right here. Then he said to his disciples, it is impossible. Somebody shout impossible. impossible. That no offenses should come. But woe to him through whom they do come. I think we need to read that one more time. He said to his disciples, it is impossible that no offenses should come, but woe to him through whom they do come. Now flip over to, to 1 Peter there. 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 6 says, There is also contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious. But to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Precious Lamb of God, we come to you tonight in the name of Jesus once again. Father, there's no other name above your name. And we thank you tonight, Lord, that you are seated in the heavenly places. I thank you, Father, that you look down on us and you send your Holy Spirit to inhabit us, God. And I ask you tonight, Lord, to inhabit us once again as we go into this time of worship with the Word. I ask you, Lord, tonight to anoint my lips to preach and teach your Word. I want you to hear it in the hearts to receive it. I ask you, Master, that no one will leave this place the same way that they've came in. Holy Spirit, we turn this service over to you tonight and say, have your way. Father, if there's any in this room tonight that's holding that offense, I ask you right now to convict them in their heart. And Lord, that they would ask for forgiveness and they would turn from that wicked way. And Father, they would move and be blessed by you. And Father, I thank you tonight for truly it is an honor and privilege to stand before your people. Use me tonight, Holy Spirit, as I yield myself as a vessel. I give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Can we give the Lord one more hand clap of praise? High five somebody around here. Amen.
Hallelujah. Y'all keep talking to somebody. that one right there. Set that one right there for me, Aaron. Please. See if it ain't that one right there. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. We'll get it right maybe in just a minute. Just a minute right there. I, just, I can't stand that squeaking in my ear. Sound like a little mouse. But today I want to look at a couple things in the scripture. Just stay with me throughout the scriptures here. But the meaning of the word believe has been somewhat weakened in our day and time. The word believe has been weakened. It's almost been watered down as to just the true meaning of, of what it actually means. What I'm saying is in the eyes of most of the people, it's become more of an acknowledgement of a fact than you believe in it, what it actually is. Does everybody understand what I'm saying right there? When I wrote that, I wasn't sure if I was writing that right. To other people, it has nothing to do with obedience. And watch how this is tied together here. But in the passage or the scripture we just read, the words believe and disobedience are represented as opposites. Okay? It's still tweaking. If you want to stay back there and just see if you can just mess with that thing. I think it's too much high in there, and I got a very low voice. In the scriptures, though, we see to believe in the Lord is obedience, but to not believe is disobedience. All right? Amen. That's what the word said that I read just a while ago. Do I need to read that again? It says, therefore, to you who believe, he is precious, but to those who are disobedient, to those that are, oh, let me go back, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious, but to those who are disobedient, the chief which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Scripture in John 3, 16, as we all know, that whoever believes in him, Jesus Christ, should not perish but have eternal life. As a result of the way we view the word believe, many think that all they're required to do is believe that Jesus existed, that he went and he died on Calvary's hill, and that they're all good, and they're standing in good fellowship with the Father, and one day they're going to die, and they're going to go to heaven just because they believe. But we know, I hope you know in here, that the devil and all of his little wimps that run around with him, they believe in Jesus too. Amen. They believe in him. They know who he is. They, uh, but they don't have the relationship that the Father desires. Amen. That's why we often, you'll hear me say stuff like a head confession versus a heart confession. A head confession is just saying, yeah, I believe that there's a Jesus, but I'm not giving my life to him. I just believe that he exists. See, the word believe has more meaning in the scriptures than just acknowledging the existence or just uh, accepting or approving to a fact. It's more than that. True to the context of the verse that we just read, we can say that the main element of believing is is obedience. Listen to me. We could read it this way. Therefore, to you who obey, he is precious. But to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone and the stone of stone and the rock of defense. It's not difficult to obey someone when you know the character and the love of the one to whom you are submitting yourself to. Ah, uh, I might need to read that again. It's not difficult to obey someone when you know the character and the love of the one to whom you are submitting to. Love is the bottom line in our relationship with the Lord, not the love of principles of teaching, not uh, but the love for the person of Jesus Christ, but for the relationship of the Lord. Listen to me for just a minute. If that love is not firmly in place, we are opening ourselves up to offense and to stumbling. Uh, I'm, I ain't got all of you with me yet. Sometimes things are said and done in love even though it doesn't seem like it is. Amen. 
How many in here have ever said something to their children or to their co-workers or to the people in ministry that they're with and it came across one way and you could have gotten offended but you knew the character and the heart of the person behind it, of the one saying it, and you said, okay, you know what? I understand where he or she's coming from so I will not grow offended to this. I will not draw offense because there is love behind what they are saying. Amen. See, I'm sure a lot of us here, including myself, got offended our parents grow up. But once we realized the love that was behind it, it was easy to be able to forgive them and move on from it. See, if you didn't do that and you still hold an offense towards your parents, then at the end of this service, if they're alive, you need to be calling them and asking for forgiveness. Do not let that go under. Let me tell you something. If you have unforgiveness or bitterness in your spirit, in your heart, I'm telling you right now, you are hindering yourself from all the blessings that God has for you. You're hindering yourself from the healings that God has for you. You may be worried, wondering why you're going through this. Going through that. Because you have unforgiveness in your heart. All right. So let's look at Jesus and the offenses that he might cause. Now, if we go back to our Sunday school ladies, amen. Y'all remember Sunday school? You think about the pictures that you see of Jesus. And he's usually presented. He's given maybe guy uh, uh, as a shepherd carrying a, a lamb or a sheep across his shoulders, and you know the old lamb's head or the sheep's head's resting right here, and, and just bang in his ear, or or maybe he's got his arms around the little children and saying we love the little children and all these things, and all of these are true, but they do not give the whole picture of who Jesus was. The pictures or paintings that we generally see or stories that we are even told never shows Jesus getting mad or upset. But how many of you know that he got a little mad and a little upset every now and then? The same Jesus denounced the Pharisees for self-righteousness in Matthew 23, 33. He says, serpents, brood of vipers, how can you escape the condemnation of hell? He also went and he turned over the tables of the money changers in the temple, ran them out. John 2, 13 and 16 says the Passover of the Jews was near. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem and he found in the temple those who were selling oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers seated at their table. And he made a scourge of cords. Basically he made a whip. And drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen. And he poured all uh, poured out the coins of the money changers, overturned their tables. And to those who were selling the doves, he said, take these things away and stop making my father's house a place of business. He told the man that wanted to bury his father before following him in Luke 9, 59 and 60. He said, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and preach the kingdom of God. A close look at the ministry of Jesus reveals a man who offended many while he ministered. Yet he was still the loving man that we knew him to be or that we have, uh, have come to know him as he was. But he was also about his father's business. Jesus, in my opinion, knew he had a task at hand and was willing to do whatever he needed to do, even if it meant offending some people along the way. Let's look at a few examples here now. On many occasions, Jesus confronted and offended the leaders all the time, didn't he? Because they were offended, they did the unthinkable thing to him, and it's even unthinkable today. What if we got offended at somebody and we went and we had them killed? But that's what they did. They were so offended by his words that they had him killed. They had him uh, hung on a cross, and, and I would say they was offended to the place that they could not return from. But Jesus loved them enough to even speak the truth to them. Matthew 5, 7 and 9 says, Hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying these people draw near me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, and in vain they worship me. This statement offended them so bad, and today it would offend half of you in this room right now if I said that same thing to you. Y'all already offended and I ain't even said it. <laughs> I got a few smiles there. But if I went around this room and I looked and I said, Pastor Jim, you ain't nothing but a hypocrite. She would probably get offended at me. Oh, if I say, Elder Bishop, you know what? You talk that talk, but you're a hypocrite, man. He would probably get offended at me. 
Now, let me say this. There would probably be an all-out rise up in this place, and I would probably be out of here, and, and y'all would have somebody else, like my wife pastoring y'all. Which, she, by the way, she did a great job Wednesday night, didn't she? <laughs> Amen. But if I did it in order to bring or shed light to save his soul or to save her soul, well, then was it truly being offensive on my part or did they misunderstand what I was saying? Do you understand the difference there? Okay, you got to understand the difference is. So notice what Jesus' disciples asked him immediately afterwards. In 15, 12, it says, Then his disciples came and said to him, do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? But look what Jesus said. Every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind leaders of the blind, and if the blind leads the blind, both will fall into a ditch. You could say that Jesus was showing us that offenses will actually purge those who are not truly planted in his Father. Some people may join churches, they may join ministries, uh, become a part of a team, but they have not been sent by God or they're not of God. All right, the offense that comes when truth is preached reveals their true motives and causes them to be uprooted and to be moved on. Mm. That's why we need the gift of discernment in the house of the Lord. That's why we got to rely on the Holy Spirit to be our guide, to be our leader, to be the one who leads people here and also removes people that don't need to be here. Let me tell you something. And on the flip side of that, though, some people leave when they're not supposed to leave. There have been many cases, think about this now, when there's leadership and ministry, I'm sure there's pastors all over this land that grieve over people who have left whether from the staff, whether from congregation members, whether for whatever it may be. And sometimes, rightfully so, it's hard when people leave as a pastor because you start to question everything you say and everything you do. Did I do this wrong? Did I do this right? God, did I misrepresentate you? What did I do? And I'm not saying that this is always the case now. Understand me. In most instances, though, people who leave the church are usually upset because truth was preached and they confronted their lifestyles. Look, I don't go around and I don't get anybody's business and I don't get any dirt on anybody from anybody. And to my knowledge, the altar workers don't do that either. So if you come down here and we speak into your life and it's something that God has revealed to us, don't get mad at us. Get mad with the Holy Ghost. Amen, Pastor. Because it's the Holy Ghost that is revealing this. And let's be real, none of us want our sins brought to light. Uh, this is why churches that preach the truth do not grow as fast as a seeker-friendly church. Mm. Don't get me wrong, they're going to grow because God wants the truth spoken. And he will grow the church. The Bible tells us in Acts that he adds to the church statement. It's not man that does it, it's not man's words, it's by the power of the Holy Spirit that it happens. But for pastors that try and hold on to everyone who comes through their doors, they would eventually have to watch everything that they say and compromise the truth of God's word. Uh, if you preach the truth, you're going to offend people and they will be uprooted and they will leave. But we must not grieve over them, but rather continue to feed and nurture the sheep that are still here, that are still saying, I don't care how bad it hurts me. I don't care if it feels like he's stabbing my heart or ripping it out. It, the truth is the truth. And if I'm wrong and doing something wrong, God show me first before you show anybody else. But I don't want to be walking around in sin, bitterness, or unforgiveness towards anybody. Don't want it to happen. Don't want it to happen. Me and my wife had a little spat before we got here tonight. I was like, I got, I got to make it right. Somebody find my wife. And she came in and she said, what do you want from me? And I was like, well, nothing. I don't see you want some coffee. And she went out and she came back in, but she came over to me. She leaned over and she gave me a kiss. 
We can't stay offended at one another, beloved. There's no way that I could come out here and minister knowing that I, me and her had, a, uh, had something against one another. We cannot hold on to offense. That was just for 15 minutes. We can't do it, beloved. You can't hold on to stuff for, for years and days and weeks or whatever it may be. You've got to get this stuff out of your spirit. You've got to get it out. Don't get upset, mad, or offended either when God moves you maybe from one ministry to another ministry. All right? Listen to me. Why? Because he may be trying to get you where he wants you, where he knows you need to be, where you're supposed to be, but you ain't been listening to him, and you've been doing it your own way, and God's trying to get you somewhere, and you might get offended, and then what God's doing is trying to move you to another part of the ministry. Just because we feel like we should be serving there does not mean that's where God wants us to be. Likewise, don't always be quick to judge or blame your leadership when someone does decide to leave. Until you know the full story, don't be quick to judge. And sometimes leadership can't give the full story. And that's where you have to extend grace just like God extended grace to you. Just because individuals that leave and go around and they try to cast blame does not mean that they are telling the truth. A lot of times when people leave due to maybe uh, sins being revealed because they got mad at what I've said or what's preached or whatever it may be, uh, and they go around and they start telling lies or speaking things, in my experience, the one that barks first is usually the one that bit. Oh, if I can go around and get everybody on my side, then when the, he comes and says something, they're already on my side. See, what happens often, you know, is some leaders try to avoid confrontation because they don't want to lose anybody, and they start to compromise the word. This is especially people get hesitant because of who they are. Uh, confronting people like the biggest tither in the church, the most influential in the church or in the community. Let me tell you, I'm going to give you a story, and I'm not going to mention any names, but I was in a class. And the, the man was teaching, and, and we was talk, he was talking about his church, and he was talking about uh, making the church grow and, and all these kind of things. But he, he started talking about something that stood out to me, and he talked about a guy that was playing the horns. I don't remember which horn it was, but it was playing the horns. And a lot of people were complaining about this guy playing the horns. They were saying that he was too loud, too loud. And Pastor, you need to tell him to be quiet. You need to tell him to hold the horn down some. And the pastor struggled with it, didn't know how he needed to do it. And the worship leader kept coming to him and said, look, man, everybody's complaining, you know, what do we need to do? Da, da. He said, we're not going to do nothing. That man gives $200,000 a year to this church. He was letting money influence his decision making. Now, that, I know we're saying, hey, that was just a horn player. But what was it when he would read God's word and didn't want to offend that man either if he found out something? Do you understand what I'm saying? be careful that we do not compromise God's word because of who somebody is, because of fear that they're going to get mad and leave. Look, if they get offended that easily because truth has been spoken, understand me, that truth has been spoken, then they need to be the ones checking their heart. See, a lot of people are afraid of hurting the feelings of someone just because they've been friends with them a long time. But the Bible tells us that we're to go to somebody you address it, and then if they don't listen, then you go back and you get some other people and come with them. And they don't do it, then you bring them before the church. Let me tell you something. I'm going to get offended you bring me before the church. So what I want you to do is come to me first. Amen? Let's go on and get that thing worked out behind closed doors. As a result, though, pastors lose their God-given authority that has been granted to them to protect and feed the sheep that God has entrusted to them. Because why? Because they stop. Uh, start compromising the word so in return they don't hear from God like they should. When we start to compromise the word of God and worry about people getting offended or getting upset, one of two things will happen in my opinion. First, the church will either end up closing because God will not allow this to happen. He will not allow his uh, word to be continue to be watered down. Or either the enemy comes in because of the compromise, and he destroys the church eventually. 
Look at another one that Jesus offended. He offended those in his own hometown. Jesus had to come to his own hometown to minister, right? But he was unable to bring any type of liberty, any type of healing to anybody who was there. And look at what he said in 13, 55, 57 of Matthew. Is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brother James, uh, Joseph, uh, Simon, and Judas, and his sisters? Are they not all with us? Where then did this man get all these things? So they were offended at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor in, except in his own country and in his own house. Jesus did not compromise the truth in order to keep them from being offended at him. The people of the town were so angry that they tried to kill him by pushing him off a cliff. And, and Luke, if we go to Luke's account in 4, 28, 30, it says, And all the people in the synagogue were filled with rage as they heard these things. And they got up and drove him out of the city and led him to the brow of the hill on which their city had been built in order to throw him down the cliff. But passing through the midst, he went his way. These people were ready to push him off the side of the mountain because of what he said. Even when his life was in danger, he never turned around and compromised the truth of what he was saying. You got to remember, every word he spoke was truth. Every word was truth. How today we need men and women of God that stand behind a pulpit or behind a podium and say, no matter what, I'm speaking the truth. You can take me out the doors and you can stone me. You can take and lock me up down in the jail. You can run me back to Monticello, Georgia, or even run me out of the state. But I'm going to preach the truth of God's word. And there's always going to be some people that are going to want to hear the truth of God's word instead of having their ears tickled all the time. Uh, Jesus offended his own staff. Six John 6, 60 through 61 and 66 says, Therefore many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can understand it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this, he said to them, Does this offend you? Skip to 66, and it says, From that time many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Things were already tough enough as it was. He's already getting ridiculed. He's already offending everybody. They're wanting to kill him. The religious leaders are trying to plot his death. His hometown has rejected him. A family that he thought was out of his, they think that he's out of his mind. And to add more pressure, his own staff members start to leave him because they're offended by his words. But Jesus still did not compromise the truth of his own word. He just told those who were left that they were also free to go if they wanted to. We have to, we got to understand just as his time here was short, so is ours. Beloved, the Bible says it's like a mist, a vapor. We're here one day and we're gone the next. We got we to gotta not worry about getting people offended, but we must forgive those that have offended us and move on to do the Father's business. If half the stuff we got upset about, 90% of the time, it's because something was taken out of context. Just taken out of context. And if we just sit back and play it over, we will see how it was supposed to be meant or supposed to have been said. Jesus even offended John the Baptist. Look at here. Luke 7, 18 and 20. Then the disciples of John reported to him concerning all these things, and John, calling two of his disciples to him, sent them to Jesus, saying, Are you the coming one, or do we look for another? Now, why is he asking, is Jesus the Messiah, or do we look for another? Put yourself for a minute in John's place. You've been the man that's been on the cutting edge, so to speak, of what God is doing. Multitudes of people upon multitudes of people have received ministry from you, from John the Baptist. You had the most talked about outreach ministry ever, ever known to the world. You've lived a life of self-denial. You won't even get married in order to maximize the potential of the ministry and the call that's on your life. You've lived in the desert. You've ate grasshoppers or locusts. You've eaten, uh, dry, uh, had wild honey. you fasted all the time. And you have fought the Pharisees and been accused of being demon-possessed. Your whole life is spent preparing the way for this coming Messiah. But now you're in prison. 
Stay with me for a minute. You've been locked up for quite some time. Nobody's hardly coming to visit you. They, everybody, had, everybody got offended right there. No one wants to visit uh, 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 you because of the attention of the people you prepared is now turned to Jesus of Nazareth. So the ones that were following you around, you locked up now they them to go over here with somebody else. Right, stay with me now. So even your own disciples have left and have started joining Jesus. Only there's a few left to serve you. And when they come to see you, they bring you stories of how this man and his disciples live a very different life from your life. They ain't living in the desert eating grasshoppers and drinking honey. No, they're not doing that. They eat and drink with tax collectors. They eat and drink with the sinners. They uh, break the Sabbath and they never fast. Listen to me. The temptation to become offended grows greater the longer you are in prison. In other words, the longer you hold on to something, the more offended you will get. And the more offended you get, the deeper rooter that uh, the deep rooter that thing rooted, rooted, not rooter. I think about roto rooter. The deeper rooted that thing becomes inside of you. And once it goes gets so deep, sometimes you can't get it out of you. You have done come to a place that you don't even know it's there anymore. You don't see that person for years, and all of a sudden you see it, something rises up inside of you, and it's that bitter, uh, that root of bitterness that's there. And yet you never ask for forgiveness, you just keep on. And you wonder why these things are happening. It's in times like this that the enemy puts stuff in your head, and then I'm sure it ain't like John the Baptist's head, that has stuff like this man that I spent my whole life preparing the way for hasn't even came and visited me in jail. Think about that for a minute. He's prepared the way for the Savior, and he ain't even coming to visit him in jail. How is this? If he is the Messiah, why don't he come and get me out of jail? Mm. I'm sure he was thinking, what have I done wrong when I've done nothing but exalted him? I've done nothing but spread the good news of who he is. So he sends two of his faithful disciples to question Jesus. They say, are you the coming one or do we look for another? Now look at what Jesus says. 7, 21 and 23 of Luke. In that very hour where he cured many of the infirmities, afflictions and evil spirits and to many blind he gave sight. Jesus answered and said to them, go and tell John these things you have seen and heard that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor who had uh, the poor had the gospel preached them, and blessed is he who is not offended because of me. In other words, he was saying, disciples, you go tell your leader, John, blessed is he if he's not offended by what? Because I haven't come and visited him in jail. Because I haven't sent him letters. But he, I have not. Uh, he's not offended because I'm doing these signs and wonders. He's not offended because I eat with the tax collector. Look, blessed is he who is not offended because of me. Jesus is saying, if the truth of the word is spoken, blessed is he who does not get offended. But how often do people get offended at the truth of God's word? There's an offense that comes without apology. Even if you're trained in God's ways, just as John was, you are still likely to have an opportunity to be offended with Jesus. If you truly love and you truly believe in the Father, you will fight to stay free from the offense of being offended. Realizing that his ways are always higher than your ways. Some people will not understand you as you start to move and flow with the Holy Spirit. As you spend more time with the Holy Spirit praying and, and, and listening and hearing Him and, and as you start to pray with people and you start to, to get discernment or you get words of wisdom or knowledge and, and you start to speak into their life and you say, you know, I hear the Lord saying this. And, and look, the hardest thing for me to do is when God tells me to tell somebody something and it, and it ain't sounding good. I'm like, oh, Lord, that's, that's not you. That's, uh, I'm not hearing from you. But sometimes it's the hard words that sets people free. And when you don't listen to the hard words of the Holy Spirit, 
he might quit speaking in your ear. So don't allow people that have an unpleasant response to the things you speak into their life have a negative effect on what you do and deter you from, from doing it anymore because if you know in your heart that what you're speaking is truth, it's okay to offend. Don't abort. Don't give up. Don't flee from it when the flow of the Holy Spirit is working in and through your life. As long as it's truth. As long as it's truth. You hear me a lot of times when I preach up here, I'll say, Holy Spirit, bind my tongue where it needs to be bound and loose it where it needs to be loosed. Why? Because if it's not truth, I don't want to speak it. I don't want to know my head. When you live for the will of God, you will not be worried about fulfilling the desires of men, women, or this world. As a result, you will often find yourself suffering. Jesus suffered his greatest opposition from the religious leaders. You can go out on the street. I can go out on the street. I could just about, I would be, if I was a betting man, I could probably bet you I could go out on the street and find somebody walking out of a liquor store, and I could go over and say, you're going to die and go to hell for doing that right there, and that man would not get offended to me. But I could go over here to James and say, James, you're going to die and go to hell you don't need to get offended. Religious folks get more offended than the people outside the doors. We need to know, beloved, that we are Christians, and we are, we are to do God's word. And sometimes it may come across a different way than what you might want it to come across. I didn't always like it when my mama hit me with a house shoe. But it's just the way it came across sometimes because I was stubborn. Amen. I'm telling you, my mama would throw a, a, a house shoe like a, a boomerang. I don't know how it would come around the, down the hall, like, but it would get me every time. But you know what? I was probably doing something wrong. So it was truth that was coming at me. You understand? Come on up, Pastor Jeffrey. If anyone challenges the truth of the gospel, it is the time to be offensive without apology. Do you understand that? Does everybody understand what I'm saying there? If anyone challenges the truth of God's word, it's time then that you are allowed to be offensive by only the word. Understand what I'm saying there? We must determine in our hearts that we will obey the Spirit of God no matter what the cost is. We're here to please the Father and not to please man. Then we will not have to make the choice under pressure because it will already have been made by the Father for us. If you look back at the scriptures we read, you will notice the only time you're allowed to offend someone, if I could say it in that way, is when it comes to the Word of God. If I read a scripture and it offends you, but it's the word, you got offended for the wrong reason. Sometimes we have to correct people. We have to encourage people. We have to let people know what's going on in their life. But we always need to do it with love. Always look at the heart of how the word's coming across. Does that make sense? I'm not the best one at that. Okay, I portray myself sometimes and, and people get upset with me because I come across but it's just because of my mentality that I, I've always been a leader my dad raised me and I was always a leader I, I, well, even when I was young when I was 16 I was over men that was five times my age it was just the way I was brought up so I had that mentality so sometimes I've come across a little harsh but know my heart behind it it's not to upset it's not to offend anyone it's just my, my demeanor, so you have to look, so you have to go beyond. If we all looked at Jesus and he came in here and started flipping things over, are we always going to walk away from him? Why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you? Summer, if he came up and called you a hypocrite, would you, not, would you still follow him? Why? Because you know the heart behind it. We have to always look at the heart behind things and how it's coming across. Don't get offended because the man or woman God that teaches you talks to you, or even preaches the Word of God to you if it offends you, as long as it's the Word of God. Jesus offended some people by obeying the Father, but He never caused an offense 
for his own benefit. As long as it's not for your own benefit. You understand where we're at? Stand to your feet for just a moment. This is a little bit of hard, a tough message. But understand my heart as your pastor. Sometimes I'm going to get a little uptight. Sometimes I'm going to be a little headstrong. But you got to understand, God has put me here to guard you. He's put me here to be an overseer of your souls. If I don't preach the truth and something happens to you, I will stand before God and answer for you. Now, you'll answer for your own thing too, but I, you got to understand, you got to just answer for you. I got to answer for all 42 of you. So understand, sometimes you got to look at the position people are in, you got to look at the situations, and then look at the heart behind it. Never make a quick judgment on anything. Always pray and seek the Lord. And if it's done, I'm telling you, if it's done in the right manner, the right manner is the Holy Spirit will give you peace in it and will somehow explain it to your spirit why it came across the way it came across. Amen? Amen. Tonight, just lead us in a song. If you need prayer for anything tonight, come down. I'm not saying you got sin or anything like that. If you just need prayer, you come down. We'll pray with you. Before we leave, I'm going to get you to say a prayer tonight. And uh, we'll, get, we'll get to that in just a minute. But Pastor Jennifer, if you just lead us in a song for a minute. If anybody needs prayer for anything, come up here and let us pray. And then just go back to your seat. And we're going we're gonna to say a prayer tonight.